Welcome to Journeys with the No Schedule Man, exploring authentic stories of personal growth and lessons learned from people living true to themselves with creativity, passion, and purpose. For all past episodes, subscribe on iTunes or visit NoScheduleman.com. And please, connect, share, and contribute with a comment, rating, or review. And now, here's your host, the No Schedule Man, Kevin Ballmer. I've been known to struggle with reality. It's not that it is any real mystery. The question this week is, what are you choosing? What choices are you making for yourself? And how are you allowing your current circumstances to affect those choices about what's possible for the future? Welcome. I'm Kevin Bulmer. This is Journeys with the No Schedule Man, exploring conversations on personal and professional growth, authentically sharing in an effort to empower each other. You can find all past episodes of this podcast worldwide on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, and at noschedulemanpodcast.com. If you're in the U.S., you can access any of those channels as well as iHeartRadio and Google Play Music. If you find this helpful, I hope you'll subscribe and do stay the course with us. I also invite you to stay up to date by joining my free email newsletter, and you can find that at kevinbulmer.com. This week, you're going to enjoy listening to a story that very well could be made into a movie at some point. This tale is going to take you to a variety of different lands, environments, challenges, and choices that have delivered all kinds of valuable life lessons along the way. It is an extraordinary tale. This week, we're joined by Rakesh Mishra, an international speaker, coach, and expert on mindset. At his website, Rakesh describes himself as, quote, an Indian village boy who made millions in Canada. And today... You're going to hear how he did that, going from growing up in a village with no electricity, television, or automobiles, to getting to another part of the world entirely, and all of the remarkable and sometimes soul-crushing challenges that he's met all along the way. This really is a remarkable story from a remarkable, gentle, passionate person. Some of the key takeaways that I took from my time with Rakesh the story of the coins and the value in what he did not find. And it, it was an amazing, life-changing lesson in mindset that he learned when he was just seven years old. Pay close attention when he gets into the story about the coins and when he's on his bike and what happened and the lesson that he took from that. Really, really powerful. Number two, the word stretch. You're going to hear Rakesh use that term stretch many times in this conversation, what he's really talking about is pushing himself past his comfort zone. And as you'll notice, there never seems to be a point in which he feels he's arrived and no longer needs to stretch. In particular, listen for the story about when he goes to the city for the first time. That alone was an enormous stretch for him. But listen for how once he arrived, he realized he was going to need to stretch himself yet again. So this is a really important thing that I've had to learn and remind myself of, of an, on an almost daily basis, of that the, the stretch and the process of that is an ongoing, never-ending process. Because your comfort zone changes the more you stretch. And the stories that Rakesh tells, terrific examples of that. Number three, reverse engineering works. Now, while I would say that the real joy is in the journey, in order to get to any new destination, you first need to choose where it is that you'll wish to go. Otherwise, life is going to choose for you. Now, I've been in the audience when Rakesh has told his story, which you're going to hear in this conversation, about deciding at the age of 35 that he would need to amass $2.5 million within 10 years. Now, people laugh at that moment. It's not a vicious critical laugh. It's an uncomfortable sort of, you must be kidding, sort of a chuckle, almost as if people are saying, yeah, right. When they see a guy talking about deciding that he's going to amass two and a half million dollars within 10 years. Well, as you're going to hear Rakesh discuss, when you choose your destination, only then do you start attracting the how to do it as as you go. And it rarely works the other way around. And as Rakesh says in this conversation, (laughs) Kevin, this reverse 
engineering works. You wouldn't hop in the car, in a plane, on a boat, without having an idea of where you were going if you ever expected to get to a certain place. And life is the exact same way. As with all things, it comes down to getting back to where we started. It's a choice. And as Rakesh likes to say, as long as you're breathing, it's not done yet. This is a remarkable story. You are going to love it. Here is Rakesh Mishra on Journeys with the No Schedule Man. Rakesh, tell me about the decision to go to Cuba all by yourself. Why did you do that? Oh, you brought me to my knees from very first question, for very first question, Kevin. So, yeah. So, uh, what had happened that uh, it was my 35th birthday and I have already spent enough time in North America. And some of my friends, they came to celebrate my birthday on that night. And after they left, I couldn't sleep on that night. Whole night I was thinking, hey, I am already 35. And soon I will be 70, 80, 100. If I'm lucky to be living that age and dead and gone. Is that all about life? So as many of us, we wonder why we came here. So, but I wanted to deep go deep into it. So next morning when I woke up, I asked my wife and two-year-old son and my parents that I want to go to Cuba. So basically the way you ask question, I went to Cuba to just be alone in solitude to, to reflect on my life, 35-year life, that what I did, what I like. So in short, just I wanted to find my purpose of life, that what I meant to do. So that was the reason took me to Cuba. You had already been through so much at that time, including growing up with a dream to come to another land and to speak in another language. And yet, having achieved that, you don't feel like that was your ultimate purpose, but maybe more of a, a stepping stone to what that was, Rakesh? I think so. I think you are absolutely right in that context, yes. So let's go back a little bit in the story and tell me about growing up and why you had such a strong desire. We're going to come back to the Cuba trip, (laughs) but right now let's go back and tell a little bit of the backstory of growing up in India and why you felt you had such a strong desire to eventually come to where you are now. Uh, Kevin, uh, what had happened that uh, if I take you a little around maybe four decades back when I was growing as a kid back in my village in India. So what had happened that, you know, one day I was around seven to eight year old and there was a, a great leader, the only woman prime minister India ever had and she came to deliver a speech to our village and she was supposed to come four o'clock but she came around 10 night and in my village I will take you to little village how that village look like this village has no connection to any modern amenities those days no electricity no telephone and no automobiles no television nothing so when she came At 10 o'clock, I still remember very, very vividly that I was holding a lantern one side and other side, another boy was holding a lantern and she delivered the speech. But when she spoke and the kind of the thundering applaud from the audience and all those foreigner journalists holding those flashy cameras and the big cars, somehow... It planted a seed inside me on that day that this is something great. Rakesh, can you do that? And that seed got planted. But as you said, I wanted to speak in English. The dream that I'm speaking in English in a foreign land and the white crowd 
is sitting and listening to me and understanding me what I am speaking in English. That was my a dream. So then I started learning this English alphabets at the age of 15 and 16, if I remember correctly. And cut the story short, it took around 20, 20, 25 years and I landed in San Francisco, U.S. one fine day. <laughs> and after and after a few years working there, I moved to Canada and I started living here. And now I'm coming to the crux you ask why I wanted to be where I am. I wanted to tell my those stories, those rags to rig, uh, rag to riches stories, those poverty and struggle those stories. But I was feeling embarrassed. If I'm going to tell my stories, people may not like me. So what happened? My aha moment came when this movie called Slim Dog Millionaire was released in 2008. And it won eight Oscars. And I went to watch a movie. I knew that movies been made on the background of Indian stories. And when I watched that movie, I said, oh, my God, I live more than 80 percent life on my own. So I have to tell a story and I may won the Oscar. So that is a little metaphorical way. But that gave me the encouragement. And my second challenge was how to deliver those stories because English speaking, that was my challenge. So one fine day, I found this resource called Toastmaster and that changed everything. So Toastmaster gave me the voice to speak out my stories. And after that, all changed. And that's how we met at Mo Monday London and Mo Monday Barry, and we are here at this, our Skype session. I hope that anyone that's listening is paying close attention in that you, I think my friend Rakesh, have already described <laughs> setting and achieving goals that most of us would think would fulfill our entire journey, and you've done five, six, seven, I don't know how many of them, and we're going to talk about each of them in detail, but I'm going to take you back to India for a moment, because I think... It's important to spend a little bit more time to describe what that challenge was really like for you, Rakesh. You talked about your village not having any electricity, no televisions, no cars. That's something that I'm guessing that most of the people that are listening to us now will have a difficult time imagining or relating to. What did you have to do in order to get yourself to grow from those circumstances and and into where you could even get to a place like San Francisco? What was that like? Okay. Uh, you know, my life is full of stories, Kevin, and I have to take you to one story which happens at the age of 11, and that changed everything. Okay. And that story goes something like this. I was around 11 year old and my mom gave me around 20 pounds of wheat because in, in, in India in the villages it's not like in Toronto that you go to a law blows or no frill and a grocery store and you buy you know the uh, basically the flour of wheat in the packet in India in those villages we have to take our grains to the mill located outside of the village to get it grinded so my mom uh, are you following Yes. So my mom gave me 20 pounds of wheat to get it grinded from the mill, which was located, say, around two miles from my home. And I just kept that uh, wheat packet in, uh, you know, in the, in the, car in, in the carrier and it started paddling on my bicycle. So what happened in India in those villages? We don't have like a nice you know, the pavement and roads like here in Canada, we have, you know, those trails full of sand and mud. And it was a, a summer of June, around 47 degree centigrade temperature. And I cannot even afford to have a full, you know, trousers. So I was with my half, you know, leg covered, whatever I was wearing, and those shorts. And while paddling, and she also gave me two coins, like a quarter, we call it a chamanni, 
in our Indian language. So same like a quarter, 25 pesa. Here we say cents in India is pesa. So I was holding those two coins in my front pocket in the shirt to pay for the grinding of the wheat. But I was scared. If I lose those two coins, my mom is going to literally beat me. So what happened when I'm paddling and also feeling scared not to lose those two coins? So when I was paddling, I was kind of a little jerking on the cycle. So while jerk, I can see the sound of, you know, jingling sound of those two coins because they are kind of, you know, trying to collide to each other. And suddenly I realized that sound is gone. So either both coins are gone or maybe one is gone because there is no sound. <laughs> so and what happened with that fearness? Somehow I lost the balance of my bicycle and I landed on that hot sand. And uh, you know what? I got a bit hurt also, but who cares about my injury? I was more concerned about my those two coins. And my hand goes to my pocket and both coins disappeared. And I said, it's okay, no problem. I'm, it's, the, the might have fallen on the sand, so I... I took around three feet radius circle and started filtering that hot sand. So I used to take a sand, uh, you know, in my palm and make little gap, to, you know, the, among the fingers so that let sand settle down and I will get my uh, coins. And Kevin, believe me, I was doing that 45 minutes. But I did not get those two coins. But I did get some smaller denomination. We call it here you know, uh, one cents, so we used to have a three cents equivalent that three pesa, I got one coin. I got some, a pin, a hair pin, you know, those girls they use. I got some button, those shirt button. I got some nice smooth rocks, but I did not get those my two coins. And now, in the back of mind, those days, out of six siblings, I'm the eldest one that I have to become rich to support the family. Basically, in India, if you are the eldest and a boy sibling, you are going to play a role like a father. So that was my role. So in the back of mind, running that I want to become rich to support the family. And now this hot sand, my legs are burning. And now I'm inside, I'm crying that mom is going to literally beat me. But I said, you know what, this is the last time I'm going to try. If I get, that's fine. Otherwise, I'll go and tell mom. And I did not get it. But now, I did not get it, Kevin, but somehow I felt a bit very happy and encouraged from inside that Rakesh, you got the way to become rich. Just see what you have done in last 45 minutes. You did not get those two coins, but you got a coin, you got a pin, you got a button, you got a smooth rock, which you have never seen on that sand you walk by every day. So today you put the efforts and your goal was those two quarters. You did not get those two quarters, but you got so many other things. So Kevin, I got the lesson there as English saying goes, always aim for the moon. Even if you miss, you will land among the stars. So that story changed me from that day onward. I started having my big dreams, big goals, and started stretching myself beyond my comfort zone on daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly basis. And I started challenging to myself, Rakesh, today has to be better than yesterday. Otherwise, you did not do your job. So till today, Kevin, I'm following that story. And from there, then every step, maybe I'll cover later on from that village, how I went to city, how did my engineering, how went to Delhi, from there, how went to Middle East and from US, every step. There is a story, so I will leave on you how you want me to move forward from that village. <laughs> You've already touched on a little bit of what I was going to ask you next is what were some of the things that you needed to do from that point or that you did do from that point to get you from, I think you said you were 11 years old that day that with time, the yes. coins? Yeah. What age were you when you landed in San Francisco? I was around 22, 23. Okay, so yeah. 
first part of sorry like, that's 20, sorry sorry I'll be, I'll be 25 I'll be 25 around 25 26 yeah so you had a little bit yeah. more than a decade almost a decade and a half from that day with the lesson of the coins to actually landing in San Francisco maybe pick out one or two things that stand out in that time that you think Rakesh embody the spirit that you just described things that you remember where you had to really push yourself to say this is another step Rakesh in in getting to where I want to go uh, to get yourself from the village to the city as you said and then to Delhi and to you know into engineering what stands out as examples of how you had to push and achieve to be able to get over to North America? Uh, oh, my God. That will be high. Oh, oh, my God. Uh, you're taking my whole life out. I don't know if I should share everything here. Oh, my God. Okay. So, again, going back to India and that village. So, that story happened when I was 11. Now, I'm 17 years old and I gave my 12th exam and the result is in waiting but I was quite a good student I knew I'm going to do well so what had happened this fine day I am working with the laborers in the in the rice field in that village but what happened I see this roaring sound of a machine flying in the sky and of course that's airplane so it comes in my mind oh my god and this boy I'm in that village, have no automobile, no electricity, no telephone, no television, nothing. The only transportation in that village is the, that bullock cart and horse cart and the bicycle. These are the only three things. But I dream, can I ride or can I, you know, uh, basically uh, fly on that machine one day, Kevin? And same thing, as I said, that in Canada, I couldn't sleep that night when my 30th birth, 35th birthday, same way, I couldn't sleep that night in my village. And second morning I woke up and we used to have, you know, the clay. I don't know in Canada if you have seen in your childhood, probably not. In our villages, there is a, uh, a kind of the piggy bank made out of clay and it has a little slit that you deposit your coin. Yep. What? Yeah. So I used to deposit those coins and uh, it's been almost, you know, maybe last 10, 12 years from the age of three or four, I started depositing those coins. So in my mind came, I'm going to break and what was money is there? I'm going to go to the city and city was around 110 to 120 kilometers. I will go to city to find because that time the only skill I developed to make money that I was helping students which are like five to six years younger than me uh, to teach them physics, mathematics and chemistry and collect coins from their parents, uh, you know, in, in, in exchange of uh, teaching them. So I thought if I go to bigger city, I will make a lot of money teaching this, uh, we call it a tuition to those students. So I wanted to go to bigger city because in the poor village, everybody is poor. So you'll be collecting maybe, uh, you know, the cents and diamond nickels. But when you go to big city, they have big money. Maybe you start collecting $5, $10, $20 equivalent those Indian rupees. But I've never been to that city. So I'm stretching here. So it came around 23 rupees, something, you know, uh, two days around half a dollar, uh, basically uh, Canadian. And now I left that village telling my parents that I'm going to my maternal uncle place to me and to meet my friends and I'll be back in a week. I lied to them. But my mission was to go to that city to find a people, students to teach without knowing anything. And that's how I boarded the train. I landed in that city. Uh, on the train, I asked people if they can help me. What is the biggest school? I don't know. What is university? So I said, what is the biggest school? And people were like a very awkward way. What this boy is asking? And But anyway, I landed there. And then finally, I reached to that university campus. And Kevin, I was the worst dressed a person on that campus. Even the sweeper, sweeper also had kind of the dress. So they were also in the better looking. And what my purpose, purpose was to the university campus to meet those professors and request them to help me to find some student to whom I can teach because they might be knowing some parents who need their, who need a, a teacher, a tutor for their kids. 
By this time, the whole day I spent in that university campus, but I couldn't gather my confidence to talk to the professor. Why? Because of my poor clothes. I was looking like a beggar. I'm sorry to put that word for myself. These are my stories when I said previously that I was feeling embarrassed to tell those stories. So whole day, and I tried to talk to some professors. I did, but they didn't pay any attention, feeling like, you know, who's this boy? And now the university is about to close around 4.30, 5 o'clock. And now I started walking back to the railway station and telling myself, Rakesh, go back to your village where your parents and grandparents belong and keep doing what they did whole life, many generations. Do this farming and you die as a farmer in that village. But my intellectual Rakesh, was talking to me, Rakesh, you whole saving brought with you. And once you go back to your village, you may never get chance to shine yourself. So try to stretch, try to do something, not to go back to that village. So then I said, what is, what was my problem? My problem was came in my clothes. So I said, how I can change my clothes? Who can help me? So while walking back to railway station, I see there is a laundry shop on the street. I was passing by a kind of the market. And I went to the laundry shop and I asked that I have this, I was uh, wearing a wristwatch from my father and I was holding one kind of dictionary, very old dictionary, 1959 version. That's my father's dictionary because I had very early awakening that English is the window I can see the words. So I always keep learning the words and, you know, translating Hindi to English. So anyway, th those two things and some cookies, homemade, and those, what were the money left? That was my belonging. So I asked that boy in the laundry counter, hey, can I borrow a pair of pants and shirt? She said, what? Because the, like in Canada, even you can uh, rent uh, tuxedos. But in India, it, this is not the system. It doesn't work like that. Only <laughs> you, give your own, you give your own clothes to get it, you know, dry, cleaned or washed, whatever it is. And I rent. You cannot borrow like that. So this boy said, oh, go away, go away, go away. You know, like a beggar, you know, the, he doesn't pay any attention. Rather, he insulted me. So I started walking. Suddenly, I heard this little soft spoken elderly sound, a voice. He said, my dear son, of course, in Hindi, in local Indian language, he said, my dear son, come here. What do you want? So I explained to him. So Kevin uh, cut the story short again. This guy listened to me and he not only provided the, you know, the clothes, he also allowed me to stay in his shop that night and gave me shoes also because I was just putting slippers in my uh, fit, uh, feet. So, and then next day I went there and again, whole day talking, talking, talking. And finally, I clicked with one professor. He was, I have spoken to him four times, interacted four times on that day. And now he was, you know, two hours about to close and he was going home. So I just went a little far, you know, ahead of him. I just, you know, knee down and kind of, you know, folded my hand. And my tears started falling. And I said, sir, in Hindi, in Indian language, sir, help me, sir. I want to teach because I, I want to study and I want to help my family. And somehow... I don't know what made him. He said, where you live? Can you meet me? And blah, blah. And that again, that shop owner took me to do his place in that evening. And then again, from there it started. I found the tuition. And then again, life started. So in that city, I was with this teaching. I was able to afford my studies and I finished my engineering. And after that, I moved to the capital of India, New Delhi, for the job. And I went there and it started working. It started working. So American Dreams starts one day. I was going to watch a movie, Indian movie. And this my friend, he said, Rakesh, let me drop my books uh, to American library and then we will go. I said, OK. So I followed him and he went inside, uh, you know, but I was just uh, waiting in that checkout area. And Kevin, I saw this a beautiful, gorgeous, a white woman, probably American because it was American library. I have never seen such a beautiful uh, woman. And I was literally staring at her. And she sensed that I'm staring at her and she looked at me. I felt really embarrassed and my eyes dropped on 
her hands and her hands was holding two books kevin and in my mind always running that americans are rich and what americans know which indian indians don't know that was running in my mind so when i saw those books i don't know what came to my mind i said i'll ask this woman that will where to i'll break a, uh, that conversation so i went to ask her uh, can i see the title of this book she said yeah sure and kevin those two books can you guess what those books could be just kind of make, make a wild guess the title of those books think and grow rich that's the first one that i'm <laughs> wow you you nailed it man Did you I? nailed it yes <laughs> so one book was napoleon hill think and grow rich and the second book was the magic of thinking big by david short kevin these two books became my financial bible and i started reading reading of course then i bought those books on that day i asked my friend and second day he got one book was available i think it was think and grow rich and the later i bought both the books and they became my as i said financial bible and i started like every month i read the book whole and i write down five things i'm going to act in my uh, implement in my life and those books became another great source of me and then my only mantra that leave india as soon as possible to go to america but how to go to america it was not easy so what i did i did some intermediate transition and from india i went to middle east it was easy for me to get job as a sales and service engineer so i went to bahrain and after spending around 3 years it was around 97 98 and y2k y2k was coming because, you know what is y2k in the in the year 2000 the date was changing in the computer systems hello yeah i'm just listening i'm <laughs> good 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 yeah and so someone told me here akash it's easy to go to us come to india and do 30 days course on this date changing things you know and then you can get your h1 work visa you go to us so that's what happened one day i resigned went to bangalore did my course and spent some time there and then i moved to san francisco on a work visa but before leaving middle east i did apply my canadian immigration i thought if the us things may not work out at least you know one thing is sure and that canada also not a bad place so <laughs> i went to us i was in california and after spending some time one day i got a call from my dad and he said uh, my dear son there is a letter from canadian consulate new delhi they want to interview you and i flew from san francisco to delhi gave an interview got got an immigration and finally landed on march 21st 1999 by air canada to montreal and from there i took a overnight bus it was snowing all along and landed at by grehon bus at bay and dundas at 8:30 am morning that's how my journey starts here in canada what was the first thing you did when you arrived in canada first things i don't know anybody so i heard that you know there are indian those turban guy they drive taxis so i was looking if i can see some taxi guy who has turban so he's probably from india at least he you know uh, indian so it will be easy for me to communicate with him so i found one guy i asked him and i uh, i started talking in indian he understood i said can you take me to some kind of you know like in motel not very expensive because you know by the time i lived in uh, middle east and in america so i know little cultural things like you know and how things works here so he took me on dandas is still st- still i go some time to pass by that motel and uh, yeah so it was like i think 25 dollars something for a day and i just went there three days i was there and the very first day morning i around 10 o'clock i settled and then i took my t-shirt it was though it was 21st march but it was quite bright and sunny so i took my t-shirt and jeans and went to uh, you know the eton center and when i came out around 6 uh, o'clock i saw roads are full of snow and those street cars and i almost started crying inside but then i uh, then suddenly saw oh no no people are boarding and i just jumped and went into that street car and came back so in 3 days i was just going and you know those uh, i think there are some newspaper i don't remember those days from the newspaper i called some rental place 
and on Dundas and Dufferin and intersection, there is a, a place for $300 a month. I rented that place and life is started from there. If you want me, I can further drill down how I got my first job and everything. So I will leave here. Again, I will wait your question. Based on that, I will move forward. Imagine renting a place in Toronto now for $300 a month. Any place. <laughs> you couldn't rent yeah. a bench for $300 a month in Toronto That's right. now. <laughs> That's right. You're absolutely right. There are, for, for somebody listening, I just want to uh, pause for a moment and, and let you know I understand there are so many things I'd love to dive in and ask Rack Cash more about with any of the stops that he's explained so far in the adventures. And yet, other than asking him about going to Cuba, which was about almost a half hour ago, I hadn't heard any of these. So we haven't even got to any of the things that I already knew about Rakesh that I wanted to make sure that I share with you today. So I'm deliberately... Um, letting some of this go so I can get to some things that I, I know that Rakesh is going to want to share and I think that anybody that's listening needs to hear. But uh, Rakesh, I think this is the first of, of many conversations that you and I are, are going to have and thank you again for, for offering this time today. So nope. we're getting closer to, to where we started about when you when I asked you about what turned out to be your 35th birthday. But at this point, you're only in your only in, but you're in your mid twenties. And am I hearing you correctly that you came to Canada, but you didn't necessarily really have a plan? I mean, how fair is it to say that you thought, well, let me get into Toronto and Canada, and then I'll figure out what I'm going to do once I get there? Yeah. Uh, so can you uh, like you didn't have you a your did you need to find a job? I mean, you already talked about you needed to find a place to live. You talked about knowing that Y2K was coming up and that you'd be able to help people with them. But how much did you know about what you were going to do, like do for oh, a living okay. and all that when, when you arrived in Toronto? Or were you just like when you went to the city for the first time in India and figured out, oh, sure, sure. I'll figure it out sure, when sure. I get there. <laughs> I'll go to the sure, library. Sure. I'll go to the laundromat. Oh. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a good one. But before that, what had happened, like, you know, uh, this weekend, uh, there was uh, some kind of the uh, conference. So I went there and I met one gentleman and he was talking to me and he got a bit curious. And he said, I think I saw uh, you on the Facebook and he started talking and he asked questions like you are asking, asking. And he said, did you write your book? I said, no, I'm in the process. He said, you write a book and making sure write in such a way because that book might turn out to be a movie making. Yeah. I said, wow, you know, so, you know, that's why he was telling. I said, wow, I have never thought of that. But anyway, now, so Kevin, answer to your question is that after, you know, uh, stretching myself, uh, going to the struggle, moving from village to that Allahabad, from Allahabad to New Delhi to Bahrain and all alone without any support and then moving to San Francisco, that big uh, city. Now I became such a kind of bulletproof in a way that I can survive anywhere. So survival was not an issue in Canada. And of course, since I work in US and Middle East, so I was having like a financial house. So I won't say that I was a millionaire, but I had enough money that I can survive six months to one year. And they all, you know, in Canada. So that survival is not an issue. But the only thing here, I knew that, you know, you'll go and you rent the place. The only thing I was uh, finding the cheap places to so that I am not going to run out my money because I don't know how long it's going to take in this new place to find my job. So what happened? Then uh, after that, when I moved to that place, then I, uh, th those days, you know, this IT was in the boom. So something called the Oracle Database Administration, Oracle DBA, this was quite high in demand. And I did not have an experience. So I started going to all those institutes. There was an employment news, I think. The newspaper name was Employment News. And in the back of that newspaper, I don't know if it's still that runs or not, in the back of the paper, and uh, that, uh, you know, all those, those institutions, you know, who are training this computer, you know, like software and all those things. And in those days, I remember there is a new, new newspaper was launched. It's called 24. Toronto 24, something. Okay. Yeah, so that was just launched. So I picked those two newspapers, and there was a place at 841 uh, 
841 uh, Young Street on Bay and Young. And I went there on the first floor and this institute, uh, you know, it's called the High Tech Institute and they used to train Microsoft and I wanted to get training on Oracle. But one thing, Kevin, I always go, you know, very nicely dressed, you know, with my long coat and my tie and shirt, everything on, like I'm already, you know, working in, in some nice job, you know, always, always has habit of like, you know, in, the, in this clothing. So when I entered to that institute in the reception and that lady talked to me and some, I said, I want to, you know, you know uh, about Oracle. She misunderstood. She thought that I want to teach here. She thought I'm a professor. And then she took me to inside and I met that owner. And he also, of course, you know, that lady conveyed to him that, you know, somebody wants to teach here. And so he started talking, you know what, we have only one girl who, who is kind of enrolled. And if you can teach to her, it's up to you. If, you, if she's satisfied with your teaching, that's fine. Uh, I can pay you. But if not, you have to refund the money. You know, that kind of thing. I said, I said. First of all, I said to you, why they misunderstood me? So I said, Rakesh, you always love taking challenge and nothing to lose here. At least you will get one month to learn something new while teaching. And again, cut the story short, I taught her and, you know, she liked it, not too much, but then... They hired me and I become a counselor also. And then I started running batches, 10, 15. And some, in the beginning, I learned from my own students. They knew more than me. But the only thing I had confidence to talk. And with that, life started moving. Around, I think, seven months I taught. I, uh, and after that, I applied in Woko Place. I got a very good job and that I went to Montreal. And that's how I entered into the IT. And that's how IT journey started. We're going to skip over a little bit again here, Rakesh, because I want to get, uh, well, to some of the things I mentioned earlier. But let's arrive back where we started. You've already <laughs> described it. I know I'm guessing You've only given us just a tiny little taste of some of the many adventures that took you to, to where you were at, at that point. But mm -hmm. you had overcome so many challenges. You had given, you, you know, you'd created in yourself and followed an insatiable desire to, to set a goal and, and to achieve it. And, as I'm listening to you, I'm feeling like you you achieved in life, you know, your mid to late twenties. What many other people I know, up to and maybe even including myself, might consider to be, you know, the ultimately successful completion of a goal in life. Like to be in a in a village like you described, and then to dream of getting to a completely different part of the world. I, I wish we had more time to really stop and try to describe just how incredible the difference is from one to the other. All right. And yet, despite proving to yourself that you could do all those things and having accomplished all of those steps and developed yourself, yourself along the way, you, you arrived at a point still when you were 35 years old where you couldn't sleep and you felt like you needed to go and, and find your purpose. Yeah. And that took you to the beaches of Cuba. Tell yeah. me more, if you would, please, Rakesh, about now that people have some context about who you are, about what you had been through to that point, about the life that you had built. What was it that was really going through your mind and your body and your soul as you were sitting on, uh, on those beaches in Cuba when you were 35? Okay. So as I said, you know, when those friends came and not only that, when I was interacting all those Indian friends and many other friends, the kind of the talk they used to have, I was thinking, hey, uh, they, uh, why they're talking so low, low in the sense, very, uh, you know, not too high in the ambition. So when I went there, I said, now I'm making money in Canada and things are moving quite well. But 
only money making and raising the family that's all about so whatever was running in my mind kevin i started writing down on the paper all my last 35 year life everything whatever i remember from the age of 4 i started putting down everything because i wanted to see the pattern that what i really love so i wrote around 1700 pages in one week and that was my vacation and vacation is over and then i call my parents and i call my agent to extend another a week and when i started reading i found out that rakesh you started teaching in that village when you are 10 year old to 5 to 6 year old kids to collect those coins when you move to your you know other cities and the engineering and daily and everywhere you are helping people man do this do this so when i used to tell them they said man how how you can be so optimistic so i used to reply them what is wrong into it and i was helping so many like even in, when i was teaching here in toronto one of the lady uh, still i remember name of rebecca and she was recording my lecture and i asked her why you record my lecture and she said rakesh whatever you teach here we can find from internet from other resources books manuals friends but the way you motivate us between those breaks with with your anecdotes and stories those really motivate us and sometimes i switch on my video camera at 2 o'clock early morning and that forces me to study i said wow so all these things when i started reviewing them one thing came flashing out that rakesh you love helping people to find their potential and live their dream life i said wow so then kevin i decided in cuba to become a billionaire not money wise a people wise that i am going to help in some way a billion people before my last breath and that's how i got my temporary purpose in a way that something i am going to look forward a billion a people and coming 1.2 billion people from india it was not that difficult but the feeling that coming in this land coming in this planet i was able to make a difference to 1 billion people that was kind of a real proud moment for me and for that i can stretch up to any extent so but immediately before helping others and i wanted to help full time not like a two years or vol- two two hours one hour volunteer no i wanted full time like a 9 to 5 that kind of things help and for that i needed to help first my own family my two year old son my parents my wife and also brother and sister back in india so i write it down what i need so i needed only three things to help myself pay up my house put down 100000 dollars for each kid for their educational fund and we were planning to have two kids and one was already born and the third thing around 5 to 6000 dollars coming every month without working as a passive income and i needed 2.5 million dollar almost to fulfill that dream and i decided in next 10 years i am going to work on that and that's how i came back to toronto with that plan and life is started a moving and you know to cut the story very little bit simple step i took i was working as a full time so after talking to the friends and other resources i came to know if i become a consultant i can make more money so i found for job through the work up place then opened my corporation and then started doing consulting with that my take home gone three to four times and the next step what i did i found out the the head hunter who was placing me getting around 3 to 4000 dollar commission every month on me so i said can i do that so it took around 2 to 2 and a half year i was able to place 10 to 12 to 15 depend sometimes 10 people sometimes 8 sometimes 15 so on an average 10 to 12 people every month i was able to place and they used to give me that commission to me so with all the extra money i put into the real estate buying a house and condominium moving better location and with that cut the story short last 10 15 year real estate really been great in gta so everything was going to work out the way i wanted for you know my uh, that financial freedom 
And with my, you know, your listener, I want to say that this reverse engineering works. First, you set your goal, then you reverse engineering. If you go other way, is always scary, doesn't work. But when you uh, set your, like in my case, it was 2.5 million my goal. That is quarter million a year, keeping 10 years goal, and then you can figure out what I can do, what I can do. So when you break into those chunks, it becomes much easier to do them. So everything was moving smoothly, but one fine day something happened which made my life totally, basically throws my life in totally different direction. If you want, I can share. It's up to you. We absolutely need to tell that story because I think it's human nature to to look at people as they are now and not really think a whole lot about what it took for them to get to where they are and to also understand that however external appearances are, we all are human, which means we all have our stories and we all have things that we live through, good and right. and, and not as good. Yeah. And about 10 minutes or so ago, you described yourself from when you got to Toronto, you had seen so much evidence of how you were able to stretch and achieve whatever you set out to do. The exact word that you used to describe yourself, Rakesh, was bulletproof. Yeah. Yet I know because we've met and I've heard some of your story that there was one thing that it didn't, otherwise you wouldn't be here talking to me today, yeah. but but almost broke you. Almost, right. almost, almost cracked you and i yeah. think that that's the story that you're getting into here next sure so kevin as i said that you know that we plan to have two kids and one kid only he was there around uh, you know basically two two and a half year old and by this time uh you know our second kid so my wife was conceived with the second baby boy and you know she was about to deliver and here i found myself in the hospital room holding my newborn three hours old baby boy in my arms in recovery room and I'm trying to play with him. But for some reason, I'm not kind of getting a happiness the way it used to be between you know newborn and a father. And meantime, a doctors took my wife away to reoperate on her because of some complications developed during the C-section delivery. And then I heard this weird sound outside, which I have never witnessed before. And I asked the nurse what it is. And she said, it's a code blue. And I have no idea what this code blue is. But now I know what code blue is. And after an hour or so, the two doctors, they entered the room and they delivered the news I was suspecting. Say, Mr. Mishra, we couldn't save her. She's no more. And Kevin, I lost the strength in my feet and just dropped down to ground. Nurse took my baby away. And I said, no thought, just silent. And while I'm sitting there, doctor talking to me that she was in really bad shape, you know, the floor is full of mess. And it will take some time, an hour or so before we clean up and we'll call you to meet your lifeless wife. So after an on an hour or so, they took me to that room where first time, Kevin, I see my lifeless wife lying there. I just kissed her. Doctor asked me if I want to call someone. I said, doctors, could you please give me a few moments I want to spend with her alone in this room? They left the room and within five seconds, I decided to commit suicide, Kevin. I said, whom I'm going to live for? My love is gone. And I decided to jump out of the window to finish myself. And I again kissed my wife and just moving towards the window. But I realized the window was closed in such a way, sealed way that I cannot open it. I said, not a big deal. They have kept little stool there. I will break the glass and jump off. 
So I took out this stool about to break, but I thought, let me make sure that everything is clear and clean other side. So when I lean over to see other side, I realize it's not high enough. I may not die. I said, okay, I'll go to rooftop and jump from there. So that's what I did. I say bye-bye to my wife. And I started moving and went to the rooftop and decided the spot to jump. But realized suddenly, hey, can I go and hug my little newborn once before I leave this world? And when I was just stare down, I came to that floor. I thought, okay, let me see once more my wife. And this time, like in the coin story, I was feeling happy at the end to get my, you know, kind of goal, you know, to become rich. Same way I was happy this time meeting my dead wife. And happy in a way when I went to Rupert, darling, give me a few minutes I'm coming. Having faith that once I'm dead, I'll go and see her. So that gave me a little inside happiness that I'm going to see her again. And after kissing and started walking towards those baby section. But hallway, I suddenly saw there is a three to four year old boy trying to play with the elderly person, maybe his dad. And I said to myself, wow, my both the boys, they lost their mom. And my wife did not have any choice. Though she tried to save her life till the last breath, but she couldn't, the way doctor described to us. But hear me, I have a choice. Either finish myself and make my boys orphan or live for them and give them a life, give them a father. Give them a parent. And Kevin, this time I realized this code blue has given me the code and another purpose to live my life. And I move, rush to that room, hold my newborn. And this time I cried, literally cried first time. And then as all those formalities happened. There were so many other things happened, but I will not go into it, keeping time and the context of the interview. So then, you know, I started playing the role of mom and dad both, and I decided not to marry again. And I remember around three and a half years past, my elder son, who was around seven, and it was Mother's Day, I remember very, very vividly and I'm sitting in the same office today here on my desk. He kept that letter, Mother's Day card. And when I read that card, and his card says a few other things and some drawings, but it says, Papa, I love you. Can you bring me a mother? <sighs> it was difficult for me to talk to the seven-year-olds. But anyway, before he goes to school, I called him. After the breakfast, I said, my dear son, why you think that you need mom? You think I'm not playing my role in a responsible way? He said, such a cute seven-year-old boy. He said, Papa, I love you. But the way you work in the kitchen, sometimes I feel so sorry that you don't know how to do that, but it's still struggle. And also, you also need Papa, you need your friend too. You need someone to talk. I said, my dear son, can you give me one year? He said, yes, Papa. And he hugged me and he left for the school. And Kevin, before basically the second Mother's Day, to so cut the story and detail you know, aside, second Mother's Day, I gifted my boys a mother, their mother. And life has started moving. So the lesson which I, from my perspective, lesson which I learned, not only this was the, I just said, I could have ended my life, so that was my breaking moment, but all my life if I see, and the lesson if I have to share with someone, to your audience, that no matter how bad situation is, 
people will get diseases people will die in the family you will lose your business the time you are living there was a time the people used to get bankrupt then the company started going bankrupt now the countries are getting bankrupt you might have heard about the greece and other countries so the chaoticness we are living so the lesson i learn no matter how bad and adverse situation is as long as you are breathing it's not done yet so we have to just wake up stand up and face that fear that situation head on and that is only way to make yourself bulletproof to face this chaotic world that's what i learned and kevin is still my journey is not done yet is still every day there is a new challenge but i am happy to meet friends like you when you shared your story that moved me i think our stories i think brought us together to understand each other more so thank you very much taking my emotions my stories out from me and i'll be really proud and glad if any of your listener can get little support little motivation little inspiration sorry kevin if i gone a little overboard not at all i look forward to many more conversations like this and i can't thank you enough for a cash for sharing as openly as you have but more than that just um just being who you are sorry man thank you it's uh, sorry <laughs> sorry for what no we oh, um, make, you, make you a bit upset you know no no it's 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 good stuff it's when you um as you heard a little bit of my story right uh i was different from you in that I thought I knew what I was here to do and worked really hard at it and found out that I was not really being true to myself and I didn't know what that was. And as I began to discover it, right. and it's funny because one of the, the, the books that was pivotal for me that really started me down this path, Rakesh, was The yep. Magic of Thinking Big. And wow. since I started to do what that book suggested I have begun to connect with other people who I uh, refer to as light spirits or angels or lighthouses and that's how I described you uh, and will continue to and it, sure. it it is it's it's somewhat mind-blowing to me <laughs> um yeah. that um yeah just how much life opens up to you when you when you live from that place that doesn't mean that you're going to have that you're not going to have adversities though Rakesh does it it just means that you're going to have other light spirits and, and angels to help you through those times absolutely 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 and, and that you may have more uh, lessons to share down the road Rakesh I could easily talk to you for another hour we uh, certainly will will do this again if you're game but but thank you again um, uh, for sharing I know this is going to help a lot of people and hopefully uh, that will add into the billion that I know that you'll reach out and, and inspire and help. And, and I look forward to continue to, to help make that dream a reality however I can. Thank you, my friend. Hey, Kevin, thank you. Because the kind of the question you asked that brought me to open myself, you know, and bring those nuggets for, uh, you know, audience to basically I'm helping audience, but I'm helping myself to taking my journey out and putting towards that my dream, that my purpose to reach out to the people, you know, so it's, I should say thank you. And, you know, man, I love your compassion <laughs> towards the humanity. I'm seeing those, your little talks, you know, Facebook and those lives and man, you know, your passion is contagious. So keep, you know, shining and keep inspiring. Believe, believe me, world need people like you there is a lot of chaoticness but we you are kind of the messenger you are kind of angels for them to show them the light and i am with you if any way i can have any association with you on your journey it will be real pride for me to have association with you kevin thank you very much for your time and 
taking my story out to your world. If you would like to learn more about Rakesh Mishra and to connect with him, you can find him on his website at Rakesh Mishra on Fire. Com. Now, all these links I will leave on the show notes blog post at noschedulemanpodcast.com. And this is episode 68. But in case you want to go there right now, let me spell Rakesh's name for you. Rakesh is R-A-K-E-S-H. His last name, Mishra, M-I-S-H-R-A. Rakesh Mishra on fire.com is his website. You'll find him on Facebook as well at facebook.com slash rakesh.com. Toronto. Again, I will link that from the episode 68 blog post at noschedulemanpodcast.com as well as a link to his LinkedIn profile. You can find Rakesh at all of those places. And on his website, you can find, uh, sign up for his free email newsletter there as well. If you liked this episode and Rakesh's story, I'm pretty sure you're going to love episode 66 with Gerard Ward, How to Eat adversity. There's a guy who was on top of the mountain when he was just in his teens, and then life started to deliver him a series of crushing setbacks, which Gerard not only overcame one at a time, but found that those setbacks shaped who he would become and what ultimately he's doing with his life right now. An incredible story. Episode 66 with Gerard Ward. The one that came the week before that, episode 65, with Sunil Godsey is called How to Follow Intuition to Success. And Sunil Godsey is the man behind Intuitionology. Give that one a listen if you liked Rakesh's story. In episode 18 with Bruce Van Horn, Life is a Marathon. And I think Rakesh's tale is evidence of that. As long as you're breathing, it's not done yet. And Bruce Van Horn had some incredible stories to share about some challenges and adversities that he has taken on and overcome and the things that he's learned along the way. Episode 18 with Bruce Van Horn. It's called Life is a Marathon. You can find those and all archived episodes of Journeys with the No Schedule Man worldwide on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, and at noschedulemanpodcast.com. And if you're in the United States, you can find this show on the U.S. feed of iHeartRadio and Google Play Music. If you'd like to connect with me, just look for No Schedule Man on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter, or visit me at kevinbulmer.com. NoScheduleman.com will take you to the same place, but either way, once you're there, you can learn more about my speaking, coaching, events, and other content. And if you'd like to be part of my online coaching community, visit theturtletribe.com. Thank you so much for listening. I hope to have you here again next week on Journeys with the No Schedule Man. Just a little danger.